We welcome everybody out tonight. Caden James and Paxton James are our last leaders tonight. And Conrad Taylor will be leading us in prayer to dismiss us to our classes in a moment. We extend our sympathy to the family of Annie Woodward. Sandy Cannon will undergo a PET scan tomorrow. Our sympathy also to the family of Buddy Corbett, father-in-law to Sandra McCabe's sister, and sympathy to the family of June Booker, Josh Manuel's aunt. We want to keep Gary Scobie in our prayers. He has COVID, and that is Rhonda Walker's father. And David Bird has some kind of a, uh, a health issue with his brain. All right, we have some events coming up. Chili Cook-Off and Bible Bowl Quiz for all ages this coming Sunday night. We'll present awards for best chili and different age group rewards for Bible Bowl. The Bible Bowl Quiz is for all ages, and it's from Romans chapter 6, King James Version, and bring chili if you want. If not, bring fixings to go with the chili, and that'll be this coming Sunday night after worship. Also at the Chili Cook-Off, we'll have a brief meeting to help plan our upcoming appreciation dinner for our senior citizens. Also, we have a day coming up. We're going to provide lunch for the teachers at Leslie Moore Elementary. And so let's be thinking about meeting to plan that in the near future. We need lots of candy, enough candy for 2,500 children that will be handed out at the Ball Boo Walk. So be bringing in your donated candy or give money so that we can purchase candy on your behalf. Hey, Miss Allie. Miss Allie. How, how old are you today? Oh, it was last week. The 15th. Four... Four years old on September the 15th. Well, I hope you had a very, very happy birthday. Any other announcements tonight? be saying thank you Lord first and last verse thank you Lord first and last verse thank you Lord for loving me and thank you Lord for blessing me thank you Lord for making me whole and saving my soul I want to thank you Lord for loving me thank you Lord for saving my soul. Please reveal your will for me so I can serve you for eternity. Use my life in every way. Take hold of it today. I want to thank you, Lord, for loving me. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. I will be singing soon and very soon, first and last verse, soon and very soon, first and last verse. Soon and very soon, we are to see the king, soon and very soon, we are going to see the king, soon and very soon, we are going to see the king, hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to see the king. No more dying there. We are going to see the king. No more dying there. We are going to see the king. No more dying there. We are going to see the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
we're going to see the king. Scripture reading will be from Psalms chapter 127, verses 3 through 5. Psalms chapter 127, verses 3 through 5. I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the, tri- are the children of one's youth. Blessed in the man who fills his quiver with them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. Amen. taller than them. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, we're blessed to have this opportunity to gather with our Christian family in the middle of the week and to share in these lessons with, with our church members. And we ask you to be with us during this time and help us all to learn something that will help us to grow as Christians and be with our children as they learn and we try to raise them in your ways and be a good example for them. Be with all those who were mentioned that are are in need of prayers and, and healing and care and help to be with those who are taking care of them and provide guidance to all of them. Be with those who were unable to be here and may they be back in our number as soon as possible. All of these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Does anybody need a pencil? You raise your hand, I'll bring you one. Anybody on this side? Last call on pencils, anybody? You're welcome. Thank you. Raph needs one. We welcome everybody to our Bible study tonight from the book of Job and invite everybody to join in our discussion, make comments, ask questions, give us your observations. That's always helpful. It's great to see you. This helps us get our spiritual batteries recharged to get us over the hump and through the rest of the week as we approach the Lord's day. We love each other even when we butt heads with each other. We love each other and we look out for each other. And this is a good time every Wednesday night. All right, uh, occasionally old Jeff Kurtz sends me these cartoons and I'll uh, share them with you on occasion, not all of them. But I kind of like this one. These guys are at a swimming pool and the guy on the diving board says, I'm not diving in till Moses goes away. And uh, I don't guess I would either with Moses standing there with his staff. The book of Job deals with one of the most complicated questions in all of life. 
And that is, why do bad things happen to good people? And when bad things happen to good people, what, if anything, does that imply about God? There are a lot of problems in our world, folks. I hardly even know how to pray anymore. Sometimes I I don't even know what to say. The world has gotten so bad in so many ways, and so much innocent suffering and and so much destructive things going on in our world. And and sometimes I just have to say, Father, I, I don't even know what to say. Just read my heart and listen to the Holy Spirit as He utters it for me. You know, I think about uh, that little town in Waverly, Tennessee, little West Tennessee town that uh, I lived across the river from uh, just a few miles away for 11 years. And that flood that came a few weeks ago and drowned 20 people. Children playing in the yard one minute, and the next minute they're swept away. And I've seen pictures of how high the water got in the elementary school. And I'm just thankful to God that it didn't happen on a school day. It happened on a Saturday because the loss of life would have been much more massive just at that school if it happened during school hours because it happened so quickly uh, there really wasn't any warning for that kind of a flood. But there's a lot of good in the world too and we need to remember that along with the bad. The flood got the Waverly uh, football field and the field house and In little West Tennessee towns, the whole town rallies around the the local football team. But their football season had to be put on hold with the possibility of not even uh, playing football this year. And if they did get their equipment to play, they'd have to play all away games. And then the other day, the Tennessee Titans made a visit to Waverly, the, the NFL team that plays in Nashville. And they brought jerseys and helmets and pads and and uh, workout equipment, exercise equipment, medical supplies. And so Waverly resumed their season, and the Titans even made arrangements for Waverly to play their homecoming game at Nissan Stadium, where the Titans played their football games in Nashville. There's a lot of good in the world as well. Let's not forget that, along with all the bad. Let's talk a little bit about the structure of the book of Job. It begins and ends with narrative. Narrative is storytelling. It begins with a story and ends with a story. There's a prologue at the beginning. There's an epilogue at the end. But about 38 chapters in the middle is dialogue. About 38 chapters, almost all of Job, except for that brief introduction. It's two chapters long, the introduction, and a brief, you know, not even a chapter ending. Except for that prologue and that epilogue, the book of Job is speeches. It's just one guy after the other making long speeches. So what is the benefit of listening to these guys talk about this topic? It's Job, it's his friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And then later on, a young man named Elihu will talk a lot. So it's, it's five guys talking about why Job is suffering And what, if anything, it says about God? What's the benefit of us getting to listen in on their conversation as they talk about this topic? It's good to hear what other people are thinking. Why is that good? It does what? We get a different perspective on things. We might have failed to look at something a certain way in our worldview. And not everything they say has to be true. In fact, all of their conclusions are wrong. All five of them. Job, his three friends, and Elihu. It's not that everything they say is wrong. It's, they say a lot of things that are right, but all their conclusions are wrong. But there's still a benefit to listen because they might say something that you didn't think about. Something that you can incorporate into your worldview. Yeah, there's a benefit to listening to these guys talk about this problem. Another reason is because it's good to know that other people have the same kind of issues that we do. That other people have the same kind of problems and doubts and worries and fears and anxieties. That other people wrestle with these difficult questions as well that other people go through tough times also. 
not just me. Uh, it doesn't take long to look around and find somebody else suffering and a lot of people suffering even more than I am. Yeah. Mm hmm You like to hear other people be correct. God corrected all of them. He's saying, hey, church, y'all listening? Mm hmm You're keep working with your kids. You're doing a good job. And I, I think I would enjoy listening to them without correcting them because I get their viewpoint. Now, maybe if I got one of them off by myself, I might have a one-on-one -on -one discussion and might try to correct them or or learn from them myself. But I don't always feel the need to correct everybody. And I feel like most of the time when I hear people talk about the problem of evil, most of the time I'm disagreeing with what they're saying. Because most of the time people blame God for everything. Oh, it's God's will. I guess God just needed her more than you did, so He took him on to heaven. God needed another flower in His garden, so He took your wife so He could enhance his garden in heaven. I mean, I don't, I don't believe in that. I don't agree with that at all. I don't think God does bad things to people. I think God uses the bad things that are done to people. But God doesn't do bad things to people, but not to innocent people. But the thing is that even though I disagree when people often talk about this or other topics, I don't always feel the need to correct them. But I do f benefit from listening to other people. I find a benefit in it. I probably told you before, you know, every once in a while, if not every day, I see a friend of mine post something on Facebook that I don't agree with. And instead of engaging them for the whole world to hear our argument, I usually just scroll on past it. <laughs> and I don't get mad at them. And they're still my friend. And... Uh, I, I take what good I can from what they had to say. But I don't feel the need to engage everybody that I disagree with. Uh, but there is some benefit to be learned from listening to other people. Well, the first two chapters are the prologue to the book of Job before the speeches start. The first two chapters set up the speech making. And there are six different scenes in this prologue. And with these six different scenes switching back and forth between heaven and earth, something's going on in heaven. We presume it's heaven anyway. I don't guess it necessarily has to be, but it's a divine council meeting taking place. And so you would think that would be happening in heaven. And then what's happening down on earth with Job? We switch back and forth between these scenes. And then when we get into the speech making, it's very long monologues. Some of these monologues go on for two or three chapters or more apiece. And it sounds Shakespearean. Even though Shakespeare doesn't come along for centuries and centuries, the point I make, or the, what I mean by that is, it sounds like it's a script for a play. Now, I'm not saying Job's not real. We talked about that last time, two weeks back when I was with you. Thank you for letting me be gone last week to deliver all those supplies to Lafitte. I really appreciate you letting me do that. It was, I've never, other than the hurricanes here last year, and we were far from the coast, this is the first time that I've actually seen the aftermath of a coastal hurricane. And the news doesn't do it justice. You, you, you really can't depict it with pictures. It really is indescribable. Boats and ships everywhere in people's yards that, you know, damaged people's houses when the shrimp and boats were blown into people's houses. But mostly flooding, you know, the whole town was flooded except for one little spot. And that's where our disaster response team is set up at that spot. But uh, just mud everywhere. The ditches on the side of the road are filled with mud from the waters receding. And they're trying to scoop it out, and it's so soupy 
They can't even really scoop it out with the backhoes. But, you know, uh, houses just filled with mud, people trying to muck out their houses. It's, it really is indescribable. Somebody told me one time they had uh, gone to the coast. I don't even remember where they said it was. And uh, they saw sharks caught in the power lines. I don't know if the water got that high or if they were blown up there or what. I've seen tornadoes do some weird things. I guess the winds of hurricanes could do that too. But anyway, how did I get on that? Oh, I was gone last Wednesday night. And so we didn't do Job last week. But thank you for letting me go down to Lafitte and help out. Um, but two weeks ago, we talked about how this is a real story. This is a real man. I, I believe that this really happened. I'm just suggesting that possibly his story is being presented as a play. The Song of Solomon was an opera type play. The different singers sing their parts. That's what the Song of Solomon is. It's two major parts, a man and a woman, and they sing back and forth to one another. And if, if that's the way the Song of Solomon is, why, you know, this is wisdom literature, poetry literature. Also, Job could be written, although it's a true story, it could be written and presented as a play, sort of, that might unfold upon a stage. But at any rate, whether that's so or not, scene one of the prologue takes place on earth. So raise your hand, and we're going to need lots of readers tonight. And uh, by the way, those of you who are watching online, it'll be hard for you to hear the readers in class and when people make comments in class. So it's, it's very good at home to get your Bible, open to Job chapter 1, and read it for yourself since you won't be able to hear us reading it here in the auditorium. So who would like to read first for us tonight? Okay, Christy, Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. Job 1, first five verses. Thank you, Christy. By the way, does anybody need a handout or a pencil? If you'll raise your hand, we'll bring you one. Everybody, anybody need a pencil or a handout? All right, we're good to go. All right. So if you need any help filling in the blanks, just, uh, just holler at me and I'll help you out. So what do we learn about Job here? He's a big shot. What do you mean by that? He was very blessed. Um, he, we learn about his riches as well as his righteous way of life. When we're told he's the greatest of all the people of the East, that's talking about his riches, his wealth. He's the richest man in the East. And when it describes his righteous way of life, it's in four ways. He's blameless. He's upright, upstanding, righteous. Number three, he fears God. Remember the conclusion of the book of Ecclesiastes? Let us hear the end of the matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is the whole of mankind. Fear God. And He turned away from evil. He shunned evil ways. That's a great description. Now, if you all are put in charge of my uh, epitaph, or my headstone, I can't think of a better one than that. I don't know if it would be true, but... If it is true, that would be a great epitaph. Here lies a man who was blameless and upright, who feared God and shunned evil. So Job was rich and he was righteous. He was both of those. In the next scene, which presumably takes place in heaven, there is a divine council meeting. 
And when I call it a divine council meeting, I do not mean that every being at the meeting was divine. But God is there. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God is there and He's divine. Therefore, it is a divine council meeting. And some others come into the meeting. So let's read and find out who those others are. Who'd like to read next? Okay, Sherry, uh, chapter 1, verses 6 through 12. Thank you, Cherry. All right. So who's at this meeting? Obviously, since it's a divine meeting, who's there? Well, who's the divine one? Obviously, God is there, okay? So God's at this divine council meeting. But also, there's somebody called in the Hebrew text, the Satan is, is also there. But it's God. That's the divine part. And they're also the sons of God. Is that what your translation says? Sons of God, b'nai ha-elohim. It's what it says in the Hebrew. B'nai ha-elohim is sons of God. And among them is uh, the Satan, it says in the Hebrew. Now, we don't know if that's a proper name. Satan, the devil, the diabolical one, the evil one, or if it's just the word Satan, which simply means an adversary or an accuser in a judicial setting. That was a word for the prosecuting attorney, um, as well as what came to be a name for the, de the devil, Satan. So not everybody that is a Satan is the devil. So is this the devil? Or is it just a prosecuting attorney at this divine council meeting? We'll talk more about it and let you decide for yourself. But is the Satan one of the sons of God? Or does he just come in with them? I guess you could read it either way, couldn't you? If he is a son of God, well, what implication is there of that? What does sons of God mean? Plural, sons of God, B'nai Ha'elohim. Hmm? Yeah, every time, as far as we can tell, every time B'nai Ha'elohim occurs in the Hebrew text of the Old Testament, it means angels. As far as we can tell, every time B'nai Ha'elohim occurs in any ancient Jewish literature, the Bible or otherwise, it means angels. And so technically what son of means is it's characterized by. Therefore, son of man is a phrase that means human or mortal, characterized by man, characterized by humanity. And son of God is a phrase that means characterized by something other than mortal, not human. Thus, sons of God means angels in ancient Hebrew literature, biblical and extra-biblical. Sons of God means angels, not humans. Beings that are other than human. And Jesus then comes along in this world where these phrases existed, and He usually refers to Himself as Son of Man, characterized by man. And He was human. He was born of a woman. But we also know that He was not just a Son of God, but He was the divine Son of God. God in the flesh. He was both Son of Man and Son of God, characterized by both humanity and divinity. 
Jesus was not 50% man and 50% God. He was 100% both. He was the God-man. Okay? But before Jesus came to the earth as the God-man, these phrases already existed and had for centuries and simply meant, son of, son of, sons of God simply meant angels. And son of man simply meant human or mortal. Well, these are sons of God. These are angels, angelic beings. And if all the clues that we have from the Old Testament that we assimilate, all the clues about the uh, possible origin of the devil are correct, and, and that's up for debate, but if all the clues that we put together are correct, then, then the devil was an angel in heaven who rebelled against God and was cast out of heaven, and all of that happened before time. All of that happened before God created the earth, before God created the sons of men, humans. The sons of God, angels, already existed, and the diabolical one, the evil, wicked devil, was one of them who had rebelled against God. Is this making any sense at all? Making sense? Okay. Okay. Um, so who is this Satan? By the way, I did want to say this. I love the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Okay? I watch it every Christmas or New Year's. Okay? But the theology is bad. Okay? Clarence did not earn his wings so he could become an angel. Okay? Humans don't become angels. Angels did not come from humans dying and then earning their wings so that they could become angels. Angels were created beings long before God ever created humans. Okay? So we don't go to heaven and become angels. We are humans. We are human souls and, and hopefully we will go to heaven, but we don't become angels when we go to heaven. Well, who is this Satan? Is it the devil? The son of God, or one of the sons of God, one of the angels that rebelled against God and got cast out of heaven? If so, how can he stand before God in heaven at this divine council meeting? How could he exist in the presence of God at this council meeting, being wicked and evil? I don't know. Maybe it is the devil. But I think we need to keep our minds open to the possibility that this Satan is simply a person at the divine council meeting who has been appointed to be the accuser, to be the prosecuting attorney, we would say, to levy charges against people. Because that's all the, all the word Satan means. It means an adversary or opponent, an accuser or a slanderer, depending on the context. In Zechariah chapter 3, verses 1 through 6, there is a judicial scene, a court scene, a divine counsel scene, and there is that accuser, the Satan, who's making charges against somebody, and that person is being defended. And that's the way court is. It's an adversarial system. You have somebody who brings the charges, and then you have another attorney who defends the defendant against the charges. That's the way a judicial scene works. So it may be that God just has an angel who is appointed with the task of being the prosecuting attorney. And that there's a benefit to having that. There's a purpose here for that. And the purpose is, as we'll see, that you know, we always talk about when bad things happen to good people, how unfair that is. But God is showing us in the prologue to Job that we ought to also look at it the other way around. What if nothing bad ever happens to God's people? Is that fair? How could we answer the allegation? Well, nothing bad ever happens to y'all because God's paying y'all to be good. How would you answer that allegation? And so the purpose of the prosecutor, the accuser, is to make sure that everything's fair. Does that make sense? So if you really want to talk about justice, 
We say, well, God's unjust because He lets bad things happen to good people. But God would be unjust if He never let anything bad happen to good people. If God paid Christians to be Christians, that would be unjust. So Job teaches us to look at it, to flip it on its head and look at it from a different viewpoint. I'll let you decide, or maybe not decide. I, I don't know if it's the devil or it's just a designated accuser for a purpose in a judicial scene. But it doesn't matter either way. The point of the book of Job is going to come out being the same. Comments? Right. 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 So, yeah, it, is it really free will to its fullest extent if being a Christian means nothing bad will ever happen? That you're guaranteed nothing bad will ever happen? Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And, but as for us, we do have a diabolical one who is against us. I do believe in the devil. Please don't get me wrong. And the devil, I think, is responsible more often than God when people blame everything on God. That there is an actual evil one who is out to destroy our souls. So for us, there is a devil. But anyway, let's move on. Um, there is a high endorsement of Job on the Lord's lips here in verse 8. This is the second time Job is endorsed this way, but this time it's on the Lord's lips. It's one thing for somebody else to say this about me, but if the Lord says it about me, wow. God says to the accuser, the Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There's none like him on the earth, blameless and upright. He fears me. He turns away from evil. Man, that would be something if the Lord gave us that praise. Cherry, do you have something? Yeah, where have you been? I've been to and fro, walking around, looking for something. Now, our Satan, our devil, something similar is said about him in 1 Peter. Is it 1 Peter? Um, he walks around as a roaring lion, seeking a soul to devour. Is this the devil here? Or is it just some, an angel? that God has tasked with the responsibility of examining things on earth and as a messenger of God, you know, reporting that, you know, here's a concern that needs to be addressed. And, and the idea would be that there are angels all around us all the time. And they're messengers of God and they're also agents of God to do His bidding. In Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, the Bible says that Christians have angels, that uh, their purpose is to aid those who will inherit salvation, to, to help those who will inherit eternal life. God, hmm? Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, that there are angels 
whose purpose it is is to, is to give aid to those who will inherit eternal life. So there are angels among us. And uh, I don't know how many of them are sitting on that microphone right there. How small or large they are. I can't see them. But I believe they're agents of God sitting here to help me get to heaven. N not to ensure I'm going, but to help me if I want to. If I'm willing to do what it takes to make sure that I can make it. So, yeah, it's something to think about. Mm-hmm. Yep. Right. Of course, at that point, when time begins, the devil, if his or if we have his origins correct, has already been cast out of heaven, and and so he's coming in to to tempt Adam and Eve, not as an agent of God, but acting on his own devices. Um, yeah. But God has his angels that are his agents that, to do his bidding. And the devil has his too. His, we would call them demons, evil spirits. So have you considered my servant Job? Look at him. And the Satan, how does he respond? What does he say after God's praise of Job? Huh? Yeah, you know, does he serve you for no reason? Or however your translation words it. It's a rhetorical question. He serves you for a reason, God. You've built a hedge around him. You've built a fence You've built a wall around Job that protects anything bad from ever happening to him. He's rich and he's righteous. He's righteous because he's rich. How do you know he's not? Well, God knows everything, but everybody else doesn't. So, he's righteous. What if he's righteous because he's rich? And so the Lord is now going to give Job the opportunity to show God that he's righteous even when he isn't rich. And that's real, uh, Dr. Taylor, that's real free will. When you continue to be loyal to God when you lose everything. That's the real test of devotion to God. So as we get into the book of Job, and we listen to him and his friends have their discussions, we never have any indication that they're aware of what happened in the prologue. We know, the reader knows, but I don't think Job and his friends ever knew that. They, they never knew why suffering comes upon Job. That it's part of a bigger divine plan they're not aware of that. And we need to remember that today. That when bad stuff happens to us, we're not aware of everything that's going on. Are we? We don't know everything. So we need to be careful about blaming God. And after all, that's the main point of Job. When we get to the end... God does answer Job and He says, okay, Job, can you make snow? Can you make a horse? Can you explain how I made the Leviathan and the behemoth? Can you do this? Can you do that? And, and Job's just left a blubbering idiot. <laughs> I never thought about it that way, God. Then why are you questioning me? There are things you don't know, Job. And see, the really 
unfulfilling thing about the story of Job is when, when we get to the end and it's over, we still don't have all our answers. But that's the whole point. There are things we don't know. We should trust God anyway, even though we're not aware of everything. When it's tempting to blame God, let's just say, God, remind me that I don't know everything, that I'm not aware of the whole story and everything that's going on. Yep. And it, you know, when stuff happens, we don't know that God did it to us. You know, maybe He did, maybe He didn't. We don't know. But even if He did, maybe there's a good reason. Any of your children wear retainers for their teeth? They're not old enough yet, are they? You got to go through the braces first, then you got to get them to keep up with their retainers and wear their retainers. So, you know, Mallory lost hers one time, made us late for somewhere we needed to be. We never did find it. We, we think she threw it in the garbage at a restaurant. And we're, we're digging through the garbage. We never did find it. I was just happy the restaurant let us go in the back and dig through the garbage. But can you imagine us digging through other people's garbage at a restaurant? We didn't find it. We were late for where we were going, but he said, well, it's okay. We'll get you another one. And then on our way out, as we're driving, we go by this terrible accident scene. That how do we know that but for the grace of God... That might have been us in that accident had we not been delayed. Did God make Mallory lose her retainer to save our life? You know, we did pray before that trip for a safe trip. I don't know. There are things I'm not aware of. But I, I'm not, I'm not going to blame God for every bad thing that happens to me because I'm not sure He did it to me. But even if He did, He might have had a good reason. He might have been helping me out. And I don't even know it. There's a lot about the divine plan we learn from the story of Job. We don't learn everything we want to know, but we learn some things. For one, temptations and trials are part of the divine plan. God never tempts people to sin. But He does allow us to be tempted and He does allow our faith to be tested. And occasionally he might even send us tests of faith of his own. It's not that every bad thing that happens that God did it, but it's that God uses it to test our faith and strengthen our faith. We grow when we're tested. Unless we fall apart in the test. Satan even, and I'm talking about the evil Satan, the evil one. I'm swatting bugs if y'all are wondering why I'm waving. I don't mean to be waving at you. Even Satan has a place in uh, God's will, probably to give us a choice, as Conrad was talking about. You know, if, if I'm just an automaton, I'm just a robot, I don't have the free will to rebel against God. I don't have any choice to serve God. I just serve him as a blind slave with no choice. That's not pleasing to God. And it's no benefit to me. But if I have free will and I choose to serve God, then that's, that's really the test of free will. And when I do the right thing and I suffer for doing right, that's really showing that I have a choice. That's real service to God. You see, God wants relationship with us. 
And if He builds a hedge around us and protects us from bad things happening, then it's not real relationship when we serve Him. When we choose to serve Him anyway, even when we suffer for it, then God can have real relationship with us. Your children grow as they face challenges. And one surefire way to raise a brat <laughs> is to rescue your child from every challenge. Now, you got to be age appropriate now. Sometimes they might be faced with something that they're too young to face and it's your job to rescue them. Okay? But I'm talking about when it's age appropriate to let a child suffer the consequences of their choices. Let them suffer those consequences. That's how they learn. That's how they mature. That's how they really grow up and not just change pant sizes, but actually grow up. We grow when we face challenges. And I have no doubt but that that's part of the divine plan as well. What's the difference between a tempter and a tester? God tempts no one. God can't even be tempted Himself. But God does allow our faith to be tested. So the difference between a tempter and a tester is intent. The assurance is that we can resist and there is a way of escape. What do y'all say back there? What is that? That it's intent? The difference between a tempter and a tester is that the tempter wants you to fail. That's the devil. But a good teacher gives tests to the students not because he or she wants them to fail. A good teacher, if if her students fail, he or she feels like a failure. A good teacher. Isn't that true? A teacher doesn't give a test to try to get the kids to fail. A test is to, to help identify strengths and weaknesses so that you can build on the weaknesses and, and strengthen the students in the area of their weaknesses. The purpose of a test, you know, you know you, those of you who've got kids, they're going to study more if they know they got a test than they will. If you just said, hey, all year long there will be no tests. Everybody's going to get an A no matter what you do. But I want you to read your textbook and I want you to do your homework and I want you to study anyway. How many of them would actually do it? Very few, probably. And even if they did, they wouldn't do it as intensely as if there's going to be a test. Well, this life is a test. This is our test. And when we get to heaven, all the testing will be over. But the tests in life, God wants to use them to strengthen us. To identify our weaknesses and work on those. God wants us to redeem us. God wants us to be joyous, but God's not so much interested in our happiness as He is in our holiness. God wants to redeem us from our sins. And if that means that we have to overcome struggles and trials and temptations, then so be it. If the end result is we get to live in heaven with God forever, then it's worth all those trials and tests of faith. God wants our holiness more than our happiness. And I don't mean to pick on parents because I was the same way, you know. Pregnant parents, you know. You having a boy or a girl, we don't care. We just want them to be healthy. And that's good. That's good. And as they grow up, what do we want for our children? Well, I just want them to be happy. Well, I want your children to be holy. 
more than I want them to be happy. And there are going to be some days that in order to help them to be holy, they're not going to be happy with you. But it's not your job to make them happy. It's your job to let God use you to make them holy. Yes, sir? Job's attitude was, we're going to serve the Lord in good times, we're going to serve the Lord in bad times, either way, we're going to serve the Lord. That's the right attitude. I just wish Job had maintained that attitude throughout the whole book. But most of the book, he accuses God falsely of being unjust. But at that point, when it says, when he says, Lord give, the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord. At that point, Job has not sinned or charged God with wrong. But starting in chapter 3 and all the way through chapter 38, Job charges God with being unjust. And so we'll get into that later down the road. Thank you all so much for being here. We've got a couple of minutes if you've got something brief you'd like to say. God's good to everybody. The good people and the not so good people. He sends rain and sunshine for all farmers. Not just the good farmers. God will even give rain and sunshine to atheist farmers. God's a good God. All good things come down from the Father of lights above. So I just want to be careful when bad stuff happens. Because I, I have to catch myself sometimes. Thinking, I get to thinking, God, why? Why are you doing this to me? And I have to remind myself, now wait just a minute, Mike. You don't understand everything. How do you know God's doing this to you? And then I have to... The, the little men in the white coats might come get me if they hear me. You know, I told you if you lived in my head for five minutes, you'd want to get out. But these are the conversations I have with myself and with God sometimes. And I, I, then I say, yeah, I understand. I, I don't know everything, so maybe God's not doing this to me. But I just want to say, but you're letting it happen, God, and you can stop it. So why don't you stop it? Why are you letting this happen to me? But uh, I'm not going to give up trusting God. Let's pray. We suffer. But at, yeah, and at the bottom line, you know, we grieve and we suffer, but not as those who have no hope. We, we are God's people, and we have hope, and one day the suffering will end. Let's bow. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful to Thee for the promise of Scripture and the hope of heaven. 
We pray that this hope would indeed be the anchor of our souls, that we can stay anchored in the truth and hold on to You and Your Word and help us never to ever be so discouraged as to give up our hope. Thank You for the hope made possible through Jesus Christ. Father, we confess that we're not aware of everything, and so we will trust You regardless of anything. We ask You to bless Sandy and all of those who deal with sickness, all of those who are grieving at this time. Help us, Father, to continue to be an encouragement to those who need us. Use us as Your instruments of kindness. Father, bless all that's been taught and said and done in this place tonight to Your glory and to our growth. In the name of Your Son, Jesus, we pray. Amen.